Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live from sunny California with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, it's time for This Week in Prophecy. Good to be with you here from California, This Week in Prophecy. There are two primary forms of democracy that exist in the world. The presidential model, which we have in the United States, and the parliamentary model. The parliamentary model that you have in Great Britain differs from what you have in the United States. France has another model which actually technically combines the two and doesn't work very well with the Fifth Republic. It has both a presidential dimension, but it has a prime minister as well. Israel has the parliamentary model based on proportional representation, unfortunately, except that the prime minister is directly elected now. So there are variations of these things. But the two basic models of democracy are the presidential and the parliamentary. In the presidential, the president runs for office independent of Congress. So you can have a president who is of one party and a Congress, either a House, a Senate, or both of a different party. But in the parliamentary model, that doesn't happen. You vote not just for your member of parliament, but you vote for the leader of that party to be the prime minister. So in order to be the prime minister of Great Britain, you need a majority of seats in the parliament. Whichever party has the majority of seats in parliament, the leader of that party becomes the prime minister. You can't vote for your local member of parliament and vote for someone else to be prime minister. If you vote for a member of parliament who is conservative or liberal democrat or labor or whatever he is, you're voting for the prime minister of the same party or the candidate of the same party to be the prime minister, whoever has the majority. Now the advantage to the parliamentary system of government, the advantage is you don't have what you have in America where a president continually fights with Congress. As the leader of his party, the prime minister has the parliamentary majority and the votes automatically to push his agenda through. It is easier to push the agenda of the party through in Great Britain under the parliamentary system. But it also has its disadvantages. Uh, you can't like somebody as a prime minister, potential prime minister, and like somebody else as a, as a member of parliament. You can't say... Well, I, I, I like my member of parliament who's a, who, who, who's a conservative, but I don't like the prime minister candidate of the conservative party. I want to vote for somebody else, as you can in America. In America, you can say, well, I'm a Democrat, but I don't want Hillary Clinton, so I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. You can't do that in, in, in a parliamentary system. You have to vote for your member of Congress or, and Senate to be your representative in Congress, and then they have to vote for the president. That's the way a parliamentary system works. It's quite different than the presidential system in America. Both systems have their advantages and disadvantages. Now, there are variations of it. Germany has a different variation of it. France has a different variation of the presidential system. Israel has a different variation. There are variations of it, but those are the two basic ones. Britain follows the parliamentary, America follows the presidential. A number of major events of prophetic significance this week taking place, as well as general items in the news that affect the position of the body of Christ in the world in which we live. Let's begin with the British elections. One does not need to be a prophet to read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, literally, nor Obadiah, verse 15 literally. 
again, we warned as soon as she did it, as soon as she collaborated with Barack Obama to knife Israel on the back with the UNESCO vote, that God's judgment was going to come against Theresa May. And it was going to come swiftly and mightily. We said it was going to happen. Does that make me a prophet that's come to pass? No. Now, if it didn't happen, it would have made me a false prophet. But the fact that it did hardly makes me a prophet. It just makes me somebody who read the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and Obadiah, verse 15, <clears throat> and looked at those things in light of the New Testament. And Theresa May is a detestable figure, a complete and utter hypocrite, as I've said. When Britain voted for a Brexit, they should have had a Brexit prime minister and a Brexit leader of the Tory party. Instead, a faction of the Tory party or the conservative party establishment wanted a pro-European anti-Brexit prime minister and behold, Theresa May nudged out both Boris Johnson, who was originally from New York City, and a believer, Angela Lederer, either one of whom would have been far more preferable than Theresa May, who's again a detestable, pathetic figure. She knifed Israel on the back and pandered to Islam. In collaboration with Barack Obama, she pandered to radical Islam. But that is not the first time she's done it. Under the Cameron coalition, another pseudo-conservative, she was home secretary for six years in charge of law enforcement and immigration. Although the British government had been warned about the London terrorists, by the Italian intelligence authorities, nothing happened. Immigration and Islamic immigration, unscreened Islamic immigration in which radicals were able to enter Britain, reached peak highs, statistical all-time highs in the six years of her tenure as Home Secretary. That woman has blood on her hands. She's responsible for these terrorist attacks because of her pandering to Islamic policies that ultimately saw her knight Israel on the back again in cahoots with Barack Obama, his last act as president. I warned God's judgment would come. Uh, again, nothing but compassion for the families and victims in Manchester and in London, both the attacks near Parliament, the attacks at London Bridge, and the concert attacks in Manchester. Nothing but compassion for those families and people. But this curse was invoked on Britain by the policies of Theresa May. God's judgment was going to come, and it began with the terrorist attacks. Obadiah, verse 15, you pander to the enemies of Israel, fundamentalist Islam. Those same enemies are going to attack you. And that is exactly what happened with Theresa May. She has blood on her hands. Her policies facilitated the influx of radical Muslims into Britain, very much in the spirit of Angela Merkel. But let's go further now. The election. She thought that by calling an election now, it would strengthen her hand politically before the Brexit negotiations take place. She nearly lost it. She nearly lost the elections. There is a populism in many nations, but especially the United States and Great Britain. It is a right-wing populism that is against the establishment and a left-wing populism. In the United States, the left-wing populism is championed by Bernie Sanders, a socialist. In Britain, left-wing populism is championed by Mr. Corbyn, a socialist. Mr. Corbyn is an opponent of Israel. He wants to parley with terrorist organizations committed to Israel's destruction, including Hamas. He even objected to armed British police shooting is armed Islamic terrorists while they had guns in their hands. The man is a complete left-wing lunatic. He's totally deranged in his thinking. And he could have become Prime Minister of Great Britain. Would have been tremendously damaging to Britain's relations with Israel and to the special relationship with the United States had Mr. Corbyn been elected. And it was the weak and flawed leadership of Theresa May that nearly brought about this disaster. It is my hope that the Tory party who pushed her in because they wanted someone who was not Brexit to negotiate Britain out of the EU 
will now be forced to remove her as a political liability, that they will take her out of number 10, where she never should have set foot to begin with. She never should have been prime minister. She's an incompetent. She's a hypocrite. She's a panderer to militant Islam. She's unfit to lead anything, much less Great Britain. Nonetheless, there she is, the puppet of the Europhile branch of the British establishment. The results of this election, however, are potentially very, very good for Britain. The best thing that could have happened. Why? One, if it removes her from office, that can only be good. If they're forced to replace her with a conservative, that can only be good. She knifed Israel and the back, and now God has caused her to get it right between the eyes. She called a general election and it backfired, blew up in her face with an unpredictable result. She got what she deserved, exactly what she deserved. May she be evicted from number 10. This would be a wonderful, wonderful development in the interest of Britain if she was gone. In fact, it would even be better if she were deselected as a member of parliament by her district. Let's continue why this is good. In order to form a government now, the Conservative Party will have to make a political coalition with true conservatives. The Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland, which has 10, sometimes 11 seats. She is short eight seats to form a government. But with the DUP, she will have 10 seats and be able to narrowly form a government. I do not like the DUP, or I should say, I do not agree with the DUP as an Irish party. But I do very much like them as a British party. They are true conservatives. They are like the Thatcherite wing of the Tory party. They are like the right wing of UKIP. They're true conservatives and even more conservative than the Tories or Nigel Farage's people. Why? Nigel Farage, as much as I like him on other issues, he basically expelled from the party a party official of UKIP over the homosexual issue because this official opposed same-sex marriage. He was trying to make it as broad a coalition as possible inclusive of homosexuals and so forth. Mr. Trump has the same position. Uh, although Mr. Pence is a conservative evangelical, Mr. Trump is not. And as we saw yesterday, hom homosexuals who were pro-Trump were not allowed to march in a gay pride parade in, in Charlotte. This is the hypocrisy of the left. But it also is one area of my dissatisfaction with the Republican Party and Mr. Trump. Nonetheless, let's understand what's happening. The Democratic Unionist Party are opposed to same-sex marriage. They are pro-life and opposed to non-therapeutic abortion. They are opposed to the EU. They are pro-American and they are pro-Israel. They're Atlanticists and they're pro-Israel. They're also no friends of Islamic immigration. They're British nationalists. With these people coming into coalition, they can negotiate for changes in the white papers and in the party platforms of the Conservative Party and move the party further in a socially conservative direction. This would not have happened had the Tories, the Conservatives, not performed so badly in the election on the Theresa May. This can only be positive. Most, if not all, of the members of the Democratic Unionist Party, most of them, if not all of them, are saved, born-again, regenerate, Bible-believing Christians, supportive of the Israel, recognizing the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, socially conservative on abortion, which they oppose, unless it's necessary for unusual medical reasons to save the life of the mother or something of that nature. They are also opposed to same-sex marriage. They are straight down the line, genuine conservatives. They are strategic conservatives, they are fiscal conservatives, and they are social conservatives. They are true conservatives. 
and the Conservative Party of England, of Great Britain, cannot rule without them. The second positive result of this election has been that Nick Clegg is now out of Parliament. He was the Deputy Prime Minister under David Cameron's government, where there was a coalition between two ideological opposites, the Liberal Democratic Party and the Conservative Party. No two parties could be ideologically more opposite, but politics prevailed over ideology. The Liberal Democrat Party and Mr. Clay are ultra pro-Europe. They advocate the most undemocratic form of democracy, which is proportional representation being replaced, um, or, I'm sorry, they advocate the most unworkable form of democracy, which is proportional representation, where small parties can negotiate with their relatively few seats excessive demands in order to, to help the major parties form a coalition. It comes down to political blackmail. Uh, in any country that's done it, in Germany, the Green Party was needed to make a coalition. So you have the ironic case in Germany of a right center chancellor, but a very much left center <coughs> Green Party controlling certain seats in the German cabinet. Uh, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. There's no popular mandate from the people based on districts in proportional representation. It's politicians and party bosses and back of closed doors who decides who's going to rule the roost. This is what Nick Clegg represented. That and making Britain an offshore colony of the EU ruled from Brussels by unelected socialists who the people of Britain didn't vote for and can't remove. That is what Nick Clegg embodied. Well, Nick Clegg is gone. He's not only gone as leader of the Lib Dems, he's gone from Parliament. He's finished. Thank God. A positive result. But there's a third strata of blessing that's come from this election. The Scottish National Party, who are a left-wing party, now led by Nicola Sturgeon, received a bash in the face from the Scottish voters. They've lost 24 seats in Parliament, many of those seats going to Conservatives. The people of Scotland in 2014 voted against leaving the UK, and the Scottish Nationalist Party has tried to force another referendum, which the people of Scotland obviously do not want. The Scottish National Party agenda under Nicola Sturgeon was flatly rejected. It was a humiliating, humiliating setback in Scotland for Sturgeon and for the left-wing nonsense she represents. Again, the Scottish Nationalist Party does not want an independent Scotland ruled from Edinburgh. She wants Scotland as an offshore colony of Europe ruled by unelected socialist bureaucrats in Brussels. You know, when they wanted to restore the Scottish Parliament as a regional parliament within Scotland, they had the historical capital Edinburgh with both Holyrood House and Edinburgh Castle. But instead of having the parliament meet in either of those historical edifices, they decided to build a new parliament building. An ugly monstrosity that went ten times over its budget <laughs> and took extravagantly long time to complete beyond its scheduled completion date. This is typical of the kind of inefficiency you see with left-wing political parties when they come to power. This is the Scottish National Party. Um, they're not Scottish nationalists in the sense of really wanting an independent Scotland. If Scotland was to have become independent, they should have become independent before the North Sea oil was nearly gone. Uh, that was the time to do it, not now. Nonetheless, this is the situation that we have. It is good that the Scottish Nationalist Party was so radically defeated in Scotland by its own people turning against it. They've lost 24 seats. I hope this is the end of Nicola Sturgeon. And she goes the way of her predecessor, Alex Salmon. These people were not good for Scotland, they're not good for Britain, they're not good for anybody except themselves. It was 
a very positive result in Scotland, a very positive result that Nick Clegg is gone, and a very positive result that the Conservative Party of Britain is now going to have to behave like conservatives, including on social issues, in order to make a coalition with the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. Again, I do not agree with the DUP as an Irish party, but I do agree with them and very much respect and appreciate them as a British party. It's the best thing that could have happened. God's judgment has fallen on this person who cursed Israel, Theresa May. Uh, her record went against her after these three terrorist attacks because for six years she was in charge of the Home Office when the intelligence community received warnings from Europe about these terrorists. And she just allowed Islamic immigration to go through the roof. She's in large part responsible for the mess Britain faces now. And the British voters held her accountable, as they should have. Fortunately, Mr. Corbyn did not get elected, but she could have caused him to get elected. She must go, let us hope, and I would say pray, that the Lord just removes her, this one who cursed Israel. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Well, God has cursed her. Well, there's been another terrorist attack carried out in the name of Allah, and you know what that means. It's time for Western politicians to protect Islam from criticism, using reasoning that should make all of us realize if ignorance is bliss, our leaders must be the happiest people in the universe. Speaking of total morons, here's conservative MP Michael Tomlinson asking Prime Minister Theresa May to confirm that the latest Islamic terrorist attack was not, in fact, Islamic. Silly me, when I want to know if something's Islamic, I go to Islam's most trusted sources. But when politicians want to know if something's Islamic, they go to other politicians, assuming they can't find an actor. Will the Prime Minister agree with me that what happened was not Islamic, just as the murder of Airy Neve was not Christian? that in fact both are perversions of religion. Yeah. You wouldn't call the murder of Ari Neve Christian, would you? So why would you call an ISIS-linked attack by a jihadi Islamic? Now most of you are thinking to yourselves, the reason I wouldn't call the murder of Ari Neve Christian is that I've never heard of Ari Neve and I have no idea why he was killed. Quick history lesson. Ari Neve was a British politician who was assassinated in 1979 by the Irish National Liberation Army, a socialist group dedicated to creating a socialist republic in Ireland. Yes, MP Tomlinson had to take us back to an assassination that took place when he was one year old to try to make a point about all religions having their extremists. So why wouldn't we call it a Christian attack? Probably because the attack had absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. Airy was viewed by the socialists as a champion of the British ruling class who was going to use the British military to crush their political ambitions in Ireland. Apart from this obvious historical point, there's an additional factor. Namely, that Christians aren't supposed to be going around assassinating people. What are Christians commanded? Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, Turn the other to him also. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Let all that you do be done in love. Walk in love. Pursue peace with all men. Honor all people. How in the name of common sense can you interpret these commands as somehow suggesting that we car bomb British politicians who stand in the way of a socialist revolution? You can't, and according to MP Tomlinson, a man who could study for a blood test and still manage to fail, this means that we shouldn't call an ISIS-inspired attack Islamic. Prime Minister Theresa May, a woman who once put lipstick on her forehead because someone told her to make up her mind, couldn't agree more. I absolutely, I absolutely agree, and uh, it is wrong to describe this as Isla Islamic terrorism. It is Islamist terrorism. It is a perversion of a great faith. I don't know what makes politicians so stupid, but it's really working. So, British Prime Minister and world-renowned Quran scholar Theresa May calls terrorist attacks a perversion of a great faith. But if slaughtering unbelievers in the name of Allah is a perversion of Islam, Islam has been perverted for nearly 14 centuries. What does Allah say in the Quran? 
Fight those who do not believe in Allah, Surah 9, verse 29. O prophets, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them, Surah 9, verse 73. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain, Surah 9, verse 111. O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness, Surah 9, verse 123. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves, Surah 48, verse 29. Allah also says in the Quran, Surah 33, verse 21, that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. What did Muhammad do? In Sahih Muslim 129, he declares, I have been commanded to fight the people until they bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. What tactic brought Muhammad victory? In Sahih al-Bukhari 2977, he proclaims, I have been made victorious with terror, not with love or kindness or interfaith dialogue. Terror brought him victory. Now, can you think of anyone who recently took Allah's words and Muhammad's example seriously? I can. His name was Khalid Masood. He's dead now after killing several people because Allah told him that true Muslims slay and are slain. And yet M.P. Tomlinson and P.M. May insist that Khalid Masood has only followed a perversion of a great faith. But if Khalid followed a perversion of Islam, Muhammad was the one who perverted it. Since Muhammad's perversion has lasted nearly 14 centuries, we can now say that, according to British Prime Minister Theresa May, Muhammad was history's greatest pervert. This election result was the curse of God against her. But it can work. It can potentially work to the benefit of Britain, and to British Christians, and to British Jews and to Israel. All of these things have a prophetic significance. We are going to see this happening more and more acutely. Those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. I was delighted to see Nikki Haley, United States Ambassador to the United Nations in Israel this week. Although Mr. Trump is a friend of Israel, Nikki Haley and, and Governor Mike Huckabee are extremely close friends of Israel. She was welcomed as a heroine figure by the Netanyahu government. She went to the Gaza border. She is the best person in terms of Middle East relations that we have in the Trump administration. The Secretary of State is not very good, and the Secretary of Defense is not very good. But Nikki Haley is very, very good indeed. And she was there this week. This again is God's mercy to America. God bless her. She may be a believer, I do not know. But let's move on. The other news. The book of Daniel tells us that the Lord establishes and removes leaders, establishes and removes kings. <clears throat> Whether you like Mr. Trump or not, he is there by the hand of God, and God spared America from this baby butchering corrupt woman, Hillary Clinton. Again, I'm not trying to align my Christian beliefs with any political party. I'm simply stating that her views on being pro-death and murdering the unborn, even right up to the time of, 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 of <laughs> delivery of birth, are treacherous and murderous. God has spared us from that wicked, wicked woman. Uh, but of course, the left exploded in anger, unable to accept the results of a democratic election. And they concocted all these stories about Mr. Trump won the election by collusion with Russia. Well, that pretty much collapsed yesterday. No indictable case can be made for that after Mr. Comey's testimony. So now they're trying to say obstruction of justice. But there's no evidence for that, no indictable evidence. I wish you would back off. Well, you can't indict somebody for what they wish for. Um, when Barack Obama went to Mr. Comey and went to Loretta Lynch over the corruption in his own administration. Why did the Obama administration and Barack Obama effectively back the 
Justice Department away from the criminal prosecution of Lois Lerner, who belongs locked up in a federal prison. That woman belongs locked up in a federal prison if she's guilty of what she seems to be guilty of. So too, Eric Holder belongs locked up in a federal prison. The man is a criminal in contempt of Congress. Loretta Lynch should be indicted and put on trial for meeting with Bill Clinton as Attorney General while the investigation of Hillary was pending and her political interference in the investigation. But nobody in the mainstream press called for the impeachment of Barack Obama. Nobody. It was fine when Obama did it, even though there was hard evidence of open corruption and the selective, effectively, persecution of conservative groups of, 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 of applying for tax deductible status, trying to manipulate electoral outcomes and so forth by misuse of the IRS in the character of Richard Nixon. These Nixonian crimes against the Constitution that were perpetrated by the Obama administration with people like Lois Lerner. But he backed the FBI and the Justice Department off. Nobody said a word. They declined to prosecute. A special prosecutor should still be appointed. Well, what's the result? It's okay for Obama, but when Mr. Trump is alleged to have done it, then it's obstruction of justice, except that there's no evidence that he obstructed justice, only circumstantial evidence, nothing that would be indictable normally. It's just a political con game by the mainstream media and the political left and the Democratic Party. The Lord establishes kings and he removes kings. Not political hypocrites like Chuck Schumer, who backed Barack Obama, Chuck Schumer being a Jew, yet backed Obama when Obama put a knife in the back of Israel. With the Iranian treaty, which was completely unconstitutional and illegal, and his last act with UNESCO. Alan Dershowitz admitted this. Alan Dershowitz also said that there is no basis for any prosecution of Donald Trump or impeachment. And again, Alan Dershowitz, although I disagree with him, he's a liberal Democrat, as a law professor, juridically I respect him. His opinion does carry weight and count. This is all a big nothing. It's about politics. It's about fake news. There is no substance. There is nothing that would be ordinarily considered to be indictable. But they won't let go. They'll just continue to play it in their desperation because there's nothing else that they can do. The gains made by the British Labour Party were not against Brexit. They were simply against Theresa May. People are disgusted with a disgusting Prime Minister. She's a disgusting political figure. Six years she was Home Secretary. Six years she allowed this immigration, including unscreened vetting of Islamic immigrants. For six years, even when intelligence reports arrived in Britain, courtesy of foreign intelligence agencies, she did nothing. It is much the same as the incompetence and corruption we saw in the Clinton State Department and in the Obama administration with the Boston Marathon bombers. We were warned about them even by the Russians, but Obama did nothing except let them come in and kill Americans. As we have these left-wing Democrat judges who want these people apparently to come in and kill Americans. They may not say that with their words, but with their unconstitutional decisions and their war against the Constitution, that is what they are saying. No, we have to understand what's happened. Jesus made it clear you'll be brought before magistrates and kings. They've always pointed this out. More and more laws are going to be made from the bench. Fewer and fewer are being made by parliaments, by legislatures, by Congress, by elected bodies. Politicians don't want to have to vote on divisive issues that can cause them votes in the next election. 
So if they let the courts decide, they can be political powers. And that's what many of them are, simply opportunistic political powers. The court decided it. The Supreme Court said it as if the Supreme Court were the supreme being. This has become out of control. We have people like Diane Feinstein, who states that she wants judges who see the Constitution not as something fixed immutable, um, and immutable, but something that is an evolving document that judges, not Congress, judges can reinterpret and change the meaning of at their will. No. Constitutionally, the Constitution can only be changed by amendments, by the amendment process, not by the courts. These people are enemies of the Constitution. That's what they are. Now understand this. What you see happening in the political realm and in the legal realm is a mere reflection of what is happening in the spiritual realm. Instead of the Word of God being eternally fixed, the Word of the Lord endures forever. People are reinterpreting it. They are even censoring it and editing it. They are redacting it. Liberal Protestant theologians have always said, the Church wrote the Bible, the Church can rewrite it. Catholicism has always said, the magisterium of the Church, headed by the pontiff, can make canonical decrees not found in Scripture that are co-equally as binding as Scripture. Again, the leaven of the Pharisees. There are those who edit out or delete biblical prohibitions against homosexuality as being an unnatural, moral, unnatural and a moral abomination. Well, this is coming to evangelical circles. You have people like Brian McLaren, one of the first gurus of the emergent church, who said the church should declare a moratorium on debating same-sex marriage and homosexuality for five years, not even discuss it. And if there's no consensus in five years, we should declare a moratorium for another five years. And then the church should decide. What right does the church have to decide? The Bible, the scriptures are not the word of the church, they're the word of God. Again, he's effectively bought into the liberal presupposition held by liberal Protestant theologians that the church wrote the Bible, the church can rewrite it. Well, Mr. McLaren, of course, then turned around and performed the same-sex marriage ceremony for his son and his son's husband. <clears throat> um, this is Brian McLaren. You've got other evangelicals doing the same thing, following the same agenda. They're s simply saying, the Bible is an evolving document. It's not fixed. I am the Lord your God, you'll have no other gods before me, other gods or demons, says Paul, the monoid. Other gods or demons, says Moses, should deem. No, Rick Warren says, we must unite with people who worship other gods, who worship demons, to bring in global peace. They're doing the same thing with the word of God. One believer who saw this issue of the cult of comp coming, and how it would play out in the sphere of education, was the Oxford Don C.S. Lewis. We mostly remember him for his classic book, The Screw Tape Letters, which I urge every young believer to read. But he wrote other books, which were almost like creedal apologies, mere Christianity, and so forth. However, other than The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia type of literature that he wrote, there was one book he wrote dealing with this very issue of the cult of comp and how it was going to impact and be impacted by the educational systems. The book is called The Abolition of Man. That book is well worth reading. Another person who saw this coming way back in the 1960s and 70s was Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Unfortunately, his renegade son is not a believer, attacks his father, but his parents were godly people indeed. Francis Schaeffer, from the Brief Fellowship, did a film series, which you can still obtain, and a book series called How Then 
should we live? How then should we live? Where he just looks at the history of the church and keeps pointing back to scripture. He does this not just from a theological perspective, but from a philosophical and practical perspective. How then should we live? There were people who saw this culture comp, this culture war you described coming, and they saw how it was going to be played out in this field of, of, of education, universities, schools. C.S. Lewis would be one, Francis Schaeffer would be another. I wish more people had read their books when I did um, way back when. Everything they said has played out almost precisely along the lines they said it would. But more than that, they gave a sense of direction by pointing back to the biblical premise. Francis Schaeffer and C.S. Lewis. I'm not saying these gentlemen were perfect. None of us are. I'm not saying I always agreed with them. I usually did, however. What you see going wrong juridically and politically in the courts, this out-of-control judiciary that's legislating from the bench and circumventing and, defying, and uh, defiling, undermining the constitutional process, attacking the Constitution, that is simply a reflection of what is happening spiritually and theologically. If they do it with God's legislation, why won't they do it with man's? They don't care about the amendment process constitutionally ordained to change the Constitution. No, we'll let a judge decree it. A judge can decree the claim. Uh, it doesn't matter what the law says, a judge can decree otherwise. The president has the right to set limits or to ban immigration of persons on the grounds of national security. That's all the law says. But a judge says, you can't do that with Muslims. <laughs> Even after the Orlando and San Bernardino attacks. Now understand, these same judges would be pro-same-sex marriage. But homosexuality and same-sex marriage is not the issue for them. That's just a political football that they can use for their purposes. They wouldn't even let pro-Trump homosexuals march in the homosexual parade the day before yesterday in Charlotte. They don't care about that. They play the feminist card. We care about women's rights. No, they don't. They had Linda Salsa defending the Saudi Arabian oppression of women. What happens to women under Sharia in Saudi Arabia is unspeakable, but she defends it. She was the leader of the Pink Hat movement. Can you imagine what the Saudi Arabians would do to Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell and Gloria Steinem? <laughs> this is the situation, reality. It's not really about women's rights or homosexual rights. These people are just being manipulated politically by people who have an agenda. But the people who have the agenda don't realize that they themselves are being demonically influenced. Now, ultimately, all these things will set the stage for the coming of Antichrist and the complete hostility of the world to Christ. Ultimately, it will come to that. But God has been showing mercy. He's been establishing leaders to give us a time. He's been gracious to Britain, and he's still being gracious to Britain. The results of this election, I would look upon as quite positive. He's being gracious to America. Now again, I like Mr. Trump's platform. I don't like all of his policies. He's not kept his word on a number of things and his attitude towards Saudi Arabia is not going to achieve anything in stopping terror. You've got to deal with the heart of the issue and he didn't do that. I'm very disappointed in him in a number of areas. But he's better than the alternative thus far. He's done some good things. And even if he hasn't, these people trying to remove him on spurious grounds with no real legal or factual basis are getting no place. And they will continue to get no place. It is God who establishes kings and removes them. It is God who establishes leaders and removes them. If Nicholas Spurgeon goes, that's the hand of God. If 
Theresa May goes, that's the hand of God. If Donald Trump stays, that is the hand of God. It is God who's in control. Expect more of this. Expect more desperation from the left. Expect more rapid and conspicuous reaction by God to those who curse Israel and who persecute believers. Expect more of this. Theresa May reaped what she has sowed. But she's not the only one who's reaped what she has sowed. This week, ISIS attacked Iran inside Iran. It bombed the tomb of Ayatollah Khomeini in the city of Qom. Let the rats devour each other. Is God turning hordes of hungry, maddened, rabid rats against each other? Let the Sunni rats devour the Shia ones, and let the Shia rats devour the Sunni ones. Now, as a Christian, I would much rather see these people get saved. But the religious philosophies to which they subscribe reduce them to the level of rats with rabies. That's what radical Islam does to people. There are moderate Islams who would not go to these extremes. But the regime in Iran are like maddened rats. And the ISIS bombers, suicide bombers who attacked Iran are maddened rats. They deserve each other. They deserve what they get. Once again, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. If you persecute the true church or you persecute the Jews, you make yourself the enemy of God. Nobody has ever prevailed against him and nobody ever will. That is what is really happening this week. I'm back of the terrorist attacks inside Iran. It's what's happening this week in what transpired with Mr. Comey. And it's what happened this week in prophecy with Nikki Haley's visit to Jerusalem and with the results of the British election. Again, you do not need to be a prophet to read Genesis 12, 1 to 3 and Obadiah 15. You do not need to be a prophet to read Zechariah 12, 1 through 10. You do not need to be a prophet to read Luke 21, 24. You do not need to be a prophet to read the book of Revelation. But even Christians too often aren't reading those passages. Even Christians are not rightly dividing the word of God. What should we expect from the world? The Lord is coming soon. All of these events that transpired this week and what they're going to lead up to point all in the same direction. The Lord has placed us here at this time for a reason. We could have been born at any time in history and we could have been born again at any time in history. But the Lord has placed us here at this time for one reason. We are here to prepare the way for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea.
the dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast. Shadows of the beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.